I mean, it only will be if you call the WCSU meeting to order at 6.05. Um, we have no amendments to this particular agenda. This is a short one. Um, can I have a motion uh, to approve the consent agenda for the resignations, new hires, and to grant the chair to approve the new WCSU hires over the summer, please? So moved. Seconded. Thank you. Do we have any questions, thoughts, concerns? None? Okay. Um, I would like to first thank both Alex and um, Nancy for their service at the WCSU over the years. They've been um, great additions to our staff and, and to our family here at the district. So thank you, thank you. Um, that means we would like to welcome Kate Kardashian back as well um, to the CSU too. So all those in favor of the motion on the table, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? The ayes have it. We we'll move forward. Can I have a motion to adjourn this WCSU meeting? So moved. I have a second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. aye. Six ten. Thank you. Um, we will call the meeting to order for the modified district at 611. Um, the amendments to the agenda are under consent agenda. We will be accepting an endowment. Um, so if you can just put that into your consent agenda. I, I'll have um, Karen just explain what, what that um, endowment grant was for. Karen, you're familiar with it, correct? Um, pardon me, because I'm getting caught up a little bit. Do you have um, a copy of it, Raina, for him? The endowment grant for the exchange program. Mm -hmm. no, oh, I got it. Yeah. Um, but we'll get to that oh, once you. we get to the consent okay. agenda. Mm -hmm. Hello, public. Mm -hmm. How are you? Mm -hmm. Can we smile a little bit, please? <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you for coming. Uh, this is your moment to bring anything to our attention. We don't necessarily, as I always say, respond back, but we definitely listen to what you have to say. And then there are other times where we feel like we need to respond back. Um, would anybody like to say anything at this moment? Hmm. Eddie's hand went up first of all. It's about this article that was in the standard. Uh, I don't know yet all the details, but I was hoping to learn something tonight about it. And uh, I just feel that it was pre-matured pre, um, printed. And I, so I talked to the author, and she said she got it off the school board or off the school website. All of this information and the pictures that are on page four. And so I still thought I was going to get a um, a decent uh, idea tonight. Because I say, there again, it sounds to me like you had all of this information and charts that were going to show what it looked like, and we were going to decide on it tonight, and come to find out from the over at the over at the uh, union uh, school over at the office that they were way, 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 it's way, way, way down the road. So, that's all I have to really say. We're not going to talk about anything from our standards. So there's not the standard published in our school that we were building a new school. So that's not true. Yeah. So, um, Eddie, just, I'll, I'll just update you briefly on this. Um, 
we have been over the last three years researching the possibilities of building a new school and a lot of research has gone into the process to date um, tonight we are voting um, on whether or not to continue with that process of then looking and exploring into if we did build a new school how then do we finance a new school and so if we vote yes to continue this process moving us forward with the conversation the next I don't know how many months uh, could be a year we will be discussing not only amongst the board and the finance director and other people within this organization but also with the community members the possibility of a new school being built and looking at what are the financial ramifications of that new school being built how do we get those monies available to us to do this project through private funding which would be donations and fundraising through um, a possibility of a bond um, to then uh, looking at tax rates and so on and so forth so we still are in the very early stages of this conversation and it is moving forward now to the financial um, feasibility of how could we possibly do this so by what you have just told me mm -hmm. I I wouldn't have to attend um, maybe another school board meeting right away correct and I would um, I would suggest to the committee who will be overseeing this process that there will be announcements to the public when discussions are being made so that if you wanted to attend those discussions to understand more like you did tonight you could so choose to do so that's, that's does that help that's a big help to me okay <laughs> i don't know whether it's any help to anybody else but well i'm glad i could help because i say i live right across the road and you may have a new view in many years <laughs> maybe i won't even be here <laughs> all right carrie <clears throat> I'm Carrie Bristow, the Modern Classical Language Department Chair for two more days. <laughs> and I do have a, a handout that I think you have the, the first part of it, but there's also a statement um, that's gone out to elementary schools that I'd like to address. Um, I have received a lot of phone calls and questions asking me about what's going on with the, the proposal for the elementary program. and so. As one of the persons on the committee, I wanted to clarify um, some things that I'm not sure are clear. So the proposal was made by a committee that had two teachers, um, Elaine Lively and myself, and a principal and a board member. So it wasn't just teachers who made the proposal. And the committee was proposed last year when the elementary language program was reduced from 1.7 FTE to 1.0 after the budget had already passed. Um, as teacher left and was not replaced so the, the remaining teacher then was seeing every student in our district um, K through 12 and most uh, sorry K through 6 in most schools one time a week which was a reduction for some schools um, so um, I, I spoke with Mary Beth about it and we formed the committee to look at exemplary programs in Vermont and New Hampshire so we did a fair amount of research talked to colleagues that we know across the state and um, looked at their outcomes when the students went into the middle school and saw um, what we felt were uh, the best practices and, and we met from September to November of this past school year and submitted the um, proposal and never heard anything about it until a bit later which was when the budget was being prepared and um, we were told that there wasn't enough budget priority to fund it K to six at this time. So I was asked my view about what to do. Should we just do K one and two? Should we do 
four, five, and six? Should we do some other kind of a model or go back to the one day a week? And we all strongly feel that the more contact you have with the language in the week, the better your proficiency will be. Although it wasn't our choice or our um, thinking that it should be um, essentially funded part of the time instead of what the full proposal was. But that's not our decision. That's the school board's decision based on the recommendations that you get. So um, this year, I believe that 1.7 FTEs were put back into the budget. So another 0.7 was added in. And um, I think it's been cut back now to 1.2 or 1.3. I'm not really certain. But if it were 1.7, I believe you probably could add the third grade back in. I'm not sure of all of that, so that would have to be looked at. But um, the reduction really, in some ways, if, it, if there is a reduction, it, it constitutes a RIF. Um, so you have the handout that shows you that it was a comprehensive program with the time increasing as the grades went higher. Um, and um, again, the, the research tells us that the more contact time with a language, the more proficient you will become. And that is certainly the goal of our world language program in this district is proficiency. Um, the second part of that handout is on the last page which is a notice that went out to um, parents. I'm not sure if every school has received it yet, but um, I did want to just mention two <coughs> things. One is that the committee that met was not just educators. It included a board member as well as a principal. So I wanted to just correct that. Um, we also uh, were not in favor of cutting it K to six, and so Although we agree that four to six, three times a week is better, we think best would be K to six. We all, um, let me get back to the couple of other things in that. Stay on the track here. We are not in agreement with digital language learning platforms for younger children. We feel that they get enough screen time as it is. It's not interactive, really. It's just games and activities that you can do using a, a tablet or a computer. And so to put that as an alternative, we do not, we are not as language teachers in agreement with that. We think that there needs to be authentic communication in a classroom with a teacher and peers. Um, there's also a statement around emotional health and wellness. And while we, uh, we, we know that that is a problem and a challenge in, in every school, um, in our district and across the state, across probably the country at this point, we think that um, students who feel good about themselves and are learning a language and feeling like they're connecting with the world, that may help that. And so those students would be denied access to world language learning until, um, until they're older. We also understand that students who are deemed in need of intervention in grades four, five, and six would be pulled out of world language. And I'm not sure how that works. It, we, we would assume they were pulled out for the whole year because how can they come in and out of a comprehensive program? They have to be out. We're not sure that's also a very healthy thing for students. In the profile of a graduate, which you're going to be taking a look at later in your agenda, it indicates the following indicators that a prof our graduates will serve local and global communities, contribute to personal and community health and wellness, respect diversity and differing points of view, and act with empathy and care for others. And we would contend that that's exactly what language classes promote, the cultural aspects as well as diversity and tolerance. We don't think that denying students access to, access to a language will contribute very highly to producing global citizens. Under self-direction, the profile of a graduate um, has de develops intrinsic initiative and responsibility for learning and exhibits a growth mindset. And we think that by being exposed to the global world promotes those kinds of things. We're concerned about separating students from their peers because of ability to learn. Uh, my role is really not to pressure you into changing your minds if this is what you as a board really want to do, but instead to just make sure that it's clear um, that the, the committee's recommendation differs from the final um, uh, plan that's in place as of now. 
um, and I, I would ask that you make it clear to your communities why the changes were made and not point to a committee who made a recommendation only to be four to six because that that was a, a recommendation to remedy the situation of not having enough FTEs to cover K to six. Um, and if there is a plan for a multi-year rollout of an exemplary world language pro program, we would like to know that and hear that and, and um, help with that process down the road. Thank you. Thank you. Well, just a, a, if I, I could respond, uh, Carrie, I, I went to late because I pulled up an email that was an exchange on January 3rd. And I'll, I'll read it to you. It's sent actually to the entire team. And it said, hi, all. Many thanks for all of your efforts around looking at exemplary world language programs. The elementary leadership team spent several hours this morning looking at the elementary schedules and have landed on what aspects of the model you put forth that, will be able, that we'll be able to incorporate for next year. Please see attached the communication that we are anticipating sending out to elementary teachers at the end of the day today. As you see, we, we will be bringing back the point seven position and move to, to a three times 45 model for students in grades four through six. If you need any clarifications or have any questions, please reach out to Hannah, who is both part of your team and part of the scheduling conversation. Um, and your response was, this is great news. Um, how, how will you configure the two positions? As I'm sure it can be challenging, thank you. And so I, you know, I, I know this is a passionate group and the group did a lot of hard work around this. Um, but one of the things that I had indicated both in the board book and at the last meeting is that this group was tasked with coming forward with the best practices for world languages and they did that. They did an excellent job in looking at that. Um, but they were not asked to discern how these practices would impact the curriculum overall um, or what might need to be given up in order to implement the recommendations. <coughs> and so that was the work of the um, principals and the school leadership team. And we came to a um, resolution that we thought honored the, um, the desire to have three times a week um, and to hold off in terms of doing the elementary piece because of other concerns about curriculum and um, the pieces there. I also wanted to just share that the point seven was actually never removed from the budget, so we didn't add anything back in. Um, but last spring, we were sitting with a situation where we had five different elementary schools and um, a collection of special subjects that were all over the map. And we were trying to bring them into a s single approach for this year. So we just, and there was a lot of concern about how the Spanish was being delivered, both from teachers and from our administrative team. And so we, we waited to hire into that position until we had a better idea of what it would, what it would best look like. So I, in, so, yes. May I say So thank you, Carrie, for your clarification. And thank you, Mary Beth, for this also new clarification. I was the board member on that committee, um, and uh, I I know that I don't know who has seen the recommendations, but I know Mary Beth just spoke to those recommendations, and I know um, Carrie. Thank you for bringing to um, to light the the either or based on I guess the budget priority of K through three or four through six, and not being able to service. K through six at this moment and how that came about because that that was new information at least um, for for me how that went and and based on that you know having a K through three and then having a gap and then going back to language that would make no sense so having three times a week four through six to me that makes more sense but I really appreciate the clarification that this you know this is not a board decision in terms of how this is implemented this is something that is done through the curriculum and ad admin teams and if it's not then we need to talk about that because I think that that's where there's some confusion um, here at on this table <laughs> and over there uh, in the public um, but I feel that it also um, 
you know, we, we won't be able to know how this change affects, you know, how our children are learning language until we see how this new structure is implemented and that won't be for another like three years. And so how can we now make sure that biliteracy is instilled in the culture of our schools because we are offering a seal of biliteracy to our children. So how do we make sure that our kids are starting to learn language earlier than the fourth grade? Because it is kind of a shock to the system to start to learn a language in grade four if you've never learned a language prior to that, it's, you know, besides your own. So linguistically, that is a fact. And so we need to look at that. And so how can we make it so that this <coughs> is part of our culture if that's what the board would like it to be? Because clearly I think that on part of our community this is important. It always has been and something that we value in our schools. So before I take any more comments from the board, this is the public comment session. So I'd like to honor that and and <coughs> could you introduce yourself so that we can have that for the minutes, please? Jamie Ziobro. Um, first of all, before I get to my letter that I'm going to read, um, Mary Beth, I think the email that you read that Carrie responded to, you didn't say that K through three was being cut. So her response of this is great news that you're doing three times per week, four, four through six, sure, that was great news. There was nothing in that email that K through three was being completely cut to zero. So I'll just point that out for the record. Um, I'm a parent of a Woodstock Elementary kindergartner and second grader. I'm also a member of the Campus Configuration Committee. I'm here to request support from the board to adopt the Configuration Committee's resolution contained on packet page 53 of your materials tonight. This step to evaluate the financial feasibility of a district-wide facility improvement plan should be undertaken, but I request that a timeline um, be included as a part of the adoption of this resolution so that this work is completed quickly and in advance of any deadlines associated with items that may be on the ballot at town meeting day in March 2020. I don't want to see this go on for years of this financial evaluation. We need to get this done now. Second, I'm here in support of second language education beginning in kindergarten across the elementary schools in our district. After reviewing the World Language Team Action Plan that Carrie uh, re referenced, I could not find within that document where we were told at the last meeting by Superintendent Banos and Senior Lively that second language instruction for our youngest students is pref that zero second language instruction is preferable to one exposure per week. What I did read in the action plan was kindergarten through second grade are recommended to have three 30 minute second language exposures per week, increasing to four 30 minute exposures in third and fourth grade, followed by four 45 minute exposures in fifth and sixth grade. We've also heard from Superintendent Banos that if you are going to do it, do it right. Zero instructor-led classes per week is certainly not doing it right, and much evidence indicates that internet-based language learning is not doing it right either. To do it right, we need to figure out how to adopt the language team action plan recommendations. Also noted in the action plan, Norwich, Lyme, Hanover, and Windsor Southeast all have two to three exposures per week for second language in kindergarten through third grade, and that increases in frequency and exposure time as grade levels advance. Has anyone reviewed the class schedules to see how these nearby districts make this happen? If it's a scheduling issue, let's figure it out. These people have figured it out. Finally, on packet page 10 of your materials tonight, the follow-through information on elementary Spanish program, and I'd encourage you all to look at that section. The, the rest of the text on the final bullet it seems to be missing. It currently reads, quote, after weighing the information in the report from the World Language Study Group and other curriculum and student needs, and then it stops. There's no period, there's nothing. Will the rest of the bullet be reviewed at this meeting tonight? And are there other bullets that were possibly mistakenly deleted? This section currently contains no follow through on this issue. Thank you. Hello, I'm uh, Sam Siegel. I have a number of kids working their way through the school system. You may recall. Um, at the meeting prior to your retreat meeting, I was standing kind of over there and I asked a couple of questions about the language situation which we um, are now discussing. And I asked a number of times, very specifically and clearly, what the decision to remove the KPP language instruction was based on. Um, and Ms. Lively and Ms. Daniels both assured me 
not one, but at least two times each, that it was based ex exactly on the recommendations from the committee. They didn't say it was based on a side conversation that occurred, or on another committee's interaction, or on anything else. They said that this is what the expert committee recommended. And that was the same thing that I was assured by Superintendent Banners in the private meetings that we had that led us to come to the meeting last time. And I have read the recommendation. It's very, very simple. Jamie just read it to you. Harry just read it to you. It's, it's super straightforward. There is nothing about it's OK to eliminate one over the other. It's not a ranked list. It's not like a, if you have to give up something, give up this one. It really recommends language for everybody in K through six. And I would encourage you to read it. It's three lines. It's super simple. Um, I know that we're talking about it might require another teacher, but it's not really, it's not that much of an expense to keep this thing, which I benefited from here at that point in my life and I still have with me and a lot of people have benefited over the years. And if you think about trying to start up a language later on in your life, it, it might seem easy, but all the research really supports that the critical years are those under seven years old. So exactly the group that we're cutting. And you just, you can't make that up. Like you can't just later on give them an extra contact per week and it's all good. There's, there's no way to make up for, the, for that good, early, consistent contact. And I would actually suggest that you'd be better off cutting out a contact per week later on and, and giving everybody something. As I, as I really tried very clearly to express to Ms. Penos in all of our meetings, one contact is infinitely better than zero contact. Giving a kid zero exposure is exactly that. It's nothing. They have no understanding that there's another language. They have no understanding that it's something you can spend time in school talking about. They have no value for that experience. Even one exposure a week, and I mean, I'm, I'm just a physicist. Like, I'm not really a super smart guy, but that one time a week has got to be better than nothing. So I would strongly encourage you to reinstate this sort of like basic fundamental element of our education, which I think a lot of people can see as valuable in so many ways besides just like the nuts and bolts of learning that language, the cultural literacy, the exposure to other people, just the, it, it's important. <laughs> it's, it's not like some fluffy kind of extra thing. And all the other things that are referenced in the other communication that we've got that are that are sort of prioritized above it, I, th I think that Kerry did an excellent job of explaining that those are an element of that education. They come throughout the classwork that you do in these foreign language programs. Um, so thank you for considering that. I'm not going to dwell on this, but I, I do want to make it clear that I feel like I was told one thing and something else happened, and that I find really troublesome. So I think it's, it's important to like base these decisions on facts. If we're going to have a specialized committee put time into doing it, to base the decision on that. And if it's not, that's fine. But you know, don't say it is. Don't try and, because there are a lot of weird conversations around town in the intervening few weeks while we tried to get to the root of how this happened. Because um, I got this document the next day after that meeting. The was very thoughtfully shared it with me, and I read the document, and I had to read it a bunch of times. I mean, English is my first language. Before I realized that the recommendation is really those three lines, and they're given as A, B, C, and it's not like a ranked choice, like it's if you got to cut one, cut the first one first. It's really a comprehensive recommendation. So. It was interesting to hear about, you know, the way tonight, the new way in which that decision may or may not have been made. I don't know, maybe it was, maybe that's not important, but please consider adding this back in. And I would also like to, um, I'm very excited about the potential for getting this building and the infrastructure up to date. And I think it would be great to get a timeline because we all know these things can stretch on and um, many of us are hoping that we can all benefit from this. My, my feeling is it's been studied really well and the funding, I don't think, some stuff that I've been hearing from around the state is not as complex as it sounds. There's a lot of community members that are happy to jump in and help out with figuring that side of things out if it's, if it's too much to just focus on and figure out summer's coming. <laughs> we would love to get this in the works and be thoughtful about it and moving it forward and have it not be something that slips to the side. It's not a, I don't think it's a small element of, of what's going on in town these days and what's going on in the surrounding towns these days. I think it would probably be one of the best things that could happen for our collective communities is to, is to get this rolling. And um, so I want you to know that there is a lot of community support for that. And let's try to make that a, a top priority that we'll sort of like charge ahead on. So thank you for your time. Is there anybody else who'd like to make any comments from the public? Yes, Patrick. Uh, Patrick Crowell, I live in Pomfret. My son Liam goes to elementary school. Um, I don't have a prepared speech 
um, which I probably should because I'm not that articulate, but I'll try to muddle through a couple of things. Um, <clears throat> I support uh, Jamie's letter and what Sam said, uh, both about the, the school and the Spanish program. Um, I guess what really troubles me is how this communication has rolled out. I think it's been really, really poor. Uh, you know, I, I get it because I run a business in town and it's really hard to communicate and I run into it constantly. It's really, really challenging. But somehow I feel like I'm a constituent and I'm getting, you know, bamboozled somehow because I went in for several other issues only to be told by, by Ms. Mills that, oh, by the way, Spanish is being dropped. Well, that kind of stinks. Um, I got one kid. I don't have time. Like, I don't have time. Like, he's in third grade, you know, next year. So I'm feeling pretty passionate about it. I'm feeling like Matt Stover, perhaps. Do I need to pull Liam out of school? You know, am I being, what else am I not learning? What else do I not know about some other program that's going on inside the school? So this is my first, you know, connection. I've got a little boy. I haven't really been to very many board meetings, but I don't know, not feeling really good, and I just need to kind of let you know that. Um, but, you know, there are so many great people in this room and so many smart people in this community. I cannot believe that we can't figure this out. How can we get our kids to speak other languages according to the recommendation. Uh, it's just hard for me to believe that we can't figure it out. And with passion and with, with enthusiasm and I don't know, it just seems, seems like as entrepreneurs here in this room, we ought to be able to figure it out. So that's all I got. Thank you. Yeah, I, I feel the need to respond to a, a couple of pieces. And, you know, first of all, I, I will say to the board and to the, the parents that spoke as I shared in the meeting that we are very committed to being sure that kids are getting a strong world language experience. Um, and we, and that we, we are looking at how to best do that balanced with other things. Um, I did want to share, you referenced that the, the folks didn't know that we were moving the program from K3. That, that email that I read was actually part of a Google Doc that outlined exactly the plan that included um, not having K3 for next year. Um, so that was not something that in any way, shape, or form was hidden from that group. Um, the, um, in terms of the reasons for this, I, I believe that I was very clear that the, the committee did recommend K through six, but that we had other factors that we needed to consider. Um, and the, those factors involve our outcomes in terms of foundational testing, our, our scheduling, our health needs. There is a budget piece to it. It was certainly not the only or primary piece. Um, but our leadership team has spent hours on this issue. And I told the group that I would go back and revisit them with them. And I went back and revisited again. And the, 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 the school leadership team felt that for next year that, that the recommendations should stand. Um, that is our recommendation as your school leaders in when we have to look at all of the pieces. And I would, I would not disagree that the, if you look at world language recommendations, they are as presented. Um, but our task was, and that group, again, was not asked just, they, they, we didn't say come back with a proposal that will discern whether or not this will fit into other curriculum areas or how to balance things. We felt that that was our, our job as a leadership team. Um, so we had to discern how trying to implement these practices would impact curriculum across the grade levels and what we would have to give up in order to do that. And we felt at this point that the, the best next step was to deliver the 3 times 45. Um, there are certainly ways in which w while we <coughs> figure this out and continue to look at this as an issue um, and continue hopefully to make progress on our outcomes around foundational skills that are, are not yet where we need to be, um, that there are ways in which we can supplement 
with technology. Um, that doesn't mean that that's the recommendation for eternity, but while we're trying to sort this out, that is one of the ways in which we could address that particular issue. Um, I, I, re I respect the passion and um, the, the, the belief around what's the most powerful um, world language program, and I don't disagree, and, and, sh and what, you know, have shared that that was the recommendation. But uh, I, in our position, we have, we cannot just look through the lens of world language. We have to look through the lens of um, students that have intervention needs. We have to look through the, the lens of foundational systems. We have to look at what other things are primary in terms of needs um, at those grade levels. So it was a thoughtful, extensive conversation, and that is the recommendation <coughs> of the leadership team. And I, I, yes. I respect that that um, some, some members of the may not agree with that, and ultimately um, the board can let us know if that's something that they would like to see changed. I will tell you currently we cannot staff but we have been unable to successfully staff just the three, three through six positions. That Spanish teachers are incredibly hard to come by. We have, we've had it posted for many, many months, and we are currently not fully staffed just at the three through six level. So Mary Beth, just um, why, not a different, <coughs> why not a different language then? If it's just because we can't find somebody who's qualified for that, what, if, what about French. It's it, that's not the primary reason. I'm just offering that okay. that's an addition. The, the primary reason has to do with the fact that there is a need to focus on foundational outcomes at the early childhood level, and that the the principals and the teachers we talked about this at our retreat have really signified that, particularly at the younger levels, we have some social emotional work to do, and that if we are going to be adding specials above and beyond what we already have, that that is the place that we need to focus first. Um, there is nobody that's saying that down the road that would not be something that we would look at, but right now, at this time, it is our assessment that that is not the appropriate approach. So this is citizens' input time, mm -hmm. and we have this on our agenda on page 10, and after just another conversation amongst board members and the superintendent, I just saw a whole bunch of more hands go up. You know, we should follow the program here. Citizens' input is now, and we have this on our agenda, and we can ask our questions at this point on page 10. Instead of us getting into the conversations here, on the need citizens' input. Can you introduce yourself? Carrie Underwood. Um, Thank you for responding. Um, I would, would, would hope that you could also respond to, and Jamie made the point about the other schools in the area that are managing to get into the schedule. I can't imagine we're the only school that has social and emotional issues with our kids. And um, if you could respond to that, um, in addition to the other things you responded to, I'd appreciate it. Um, sure. So every district is different, right? And every district has areas that they see as areas of challenge and areas of need um, and areas of strength. Um, and so I, you know, each district, we, we can't say because this district does it, it's right for us, right? That right now we have some foundational outcomes in the area of English language arts and mathematics that I think the board has been pretty clear about is not where it needs to be. And so that may not be the case in some of these other districts. And so it is our, uh, our intent to focus on those needs and bring those up to the level where, where we believe that they need to be and I believe the board believes that they need to be. And then we look at this particular issue while at the same time maintaining what I would, would, would argue is probably one of the stronger world language programs in the state. Having fourth, fifth, and sixth graders have world language three times a week for 45 minutes is a very significant world language program. It's not the perfect world language program, but I, I, and I would have to do a little bit more research on that, but I can say with some, some level of confidence that I think it would probably, probably exceed 
what you would see in most school districts. Do I have it? Yes. Hi, my name is Max Ely. Uh, I have three adult children. I went through the Woodstock schools a number of years ago. And this topic is not even what brought me to this meeting tonight, but I have to go on record to say I'm incredibly saddened by this conversation. Spanish came into the schools 25 or so years ago. I worked on that committee back in the late 80s, early 90s. It's been a strong presence ever since. Thanks to teachers like Carrie and others, I have three children that speak Spanish. It's the only exposure they had to Spanish was in the Woodstock schools. And I can't tell you, have to, after having worked on the strategic plan for redeveloping and looking at the curriculum, looking at the college, uh, the high school graduate, I just feels like a major step in the wrong direction and that we're prioritizing the wrong thing. Thank you. Any other comments from the public? Hi, I'm Allison. I'm a junior in high school. I've taken Spanish, I don't know how many years, probably since I was in first or second grade. Um, it has been something that has been pretty important for my high school, high school experience too. I did the three month long study abroad program that our school has. Um, I would say we might be focusing on the wrong thing because I also heard mentioned that there would be students who would be pulled out of the four through six Spanish, which basically constitutes tracking for the entire year. And I would be more concerned about tracking students starting in the fourth grade than I would be about having kindergarten first and second miss out on it. So that's, that's just my thinking of that could be emotionally challenging to kids to be told you can't do something and start being tracked when you're in fourth grade. Thank you. If, if I could respond, because I think that's an, an excellent point and I appreciate your concern for, for students. So when we have students that are struggling in academic areas, the, the way in which we can make sure that they stay on track is through um, intervention, which is the second dose of an area that they're struggling in. Um, and so if you're going to provide students with a second dose of something that they're struggling in, they, they, have, they can't do something else. Um, and so what is that something else? Um, and Spanish is the, would be the only subject in those grade levels that would be three times exposure. And just like in a foreign language, multiple exposures being really helpful, intervention operates in the same way, that you need multiple exposures in order for it to be impactful. Um, in the end, that decision would always rest with the, the family. Uh, we would make recommendations about what we think is appropriate for students. Um, but if a family decides that they would rather a child not have an intervention and prefer to be in the Spanish program, that's certainly something that we would respect. Anyone else? Okay, just real brief, it, since this is public participation, I think it's important for future reference for scheduling of board meetings and school events and senior leadership. There's two school graduations tonight, so that significantly limits public participation, right? So we have two school communities that are really are not represented here. I'm only here because I left a graduation early, so I think that's something we need to think about moving forward as well. Okay, thank you. All right, <coughs> we're gonna move forward to board reports. Um, I just wanna make everybody aware that tonight is our last official meeting, however, um, keep your emails on because we will probably have a special meeting before the end of June um, to accept some of the policies that are being moved forward um, in front of us. Um, also, graduation for the high school students is on Friday at 6 o'clock. Um, it has been a tradition um, of our board to sit with the administrators as well as the teachers. If you so choose and you would like to participate that way, please RSVP me so I can make sure that there are enough chairs for everybody. Um, the chair uh, traditionally, historically, has handed out the uh, diplomas 
um, as well as board members are able to hand out diplomas to their graduating seniors if they so choose. Um, Lou and Bob, you have graduating seniors. If you would like to do that, please let me know and we'll make the necessary arrangements to do that as well. Thank you. Okay. Um, in response to our, our upcoming vote for um, uh, going into a, a finance research feasibility study, I just want to address um, the public that yes, part of that uh, plan will be putting a calendar together so that we can follow it verbatim and get that going as quickly as possible so that it is not another three-year study, but it is a shorter project in that, in that right. So just a heads up there. Um, other than that, that's all I have to report. Policy will report when we have the presentation of the policies. We have enough. Exactly. Yeah. Later, Bob, I don't think there's anything you want to add tonight. Uh, no, just the conversation to come. Yeah, okay. Um, and that's it for now. So, Mary and Beth, we're going to go into um, your report. Everybody does have the written report from RAF. Please read it through. Um, just to update yourself on, on what's happening from instructional services. Mary Beth, is there? Yeah, and just one other thing. You also had, as was pointed out, there was a, an error in the printing of the book, so you have in front of you the full text of the, um, the follow through in terms of the, the Spanish conversation. So that is a separate thing. Um, so a couple things to fill the board in. One of the things that, that, that we had shared with the writing community and the board tasked us to do is to ensure that there were um, transition programs and events in place for the writing students who will be um, moving on to us <coughs> next year. I, I had the pleasure of stopping by Reading today. They had a, uh, a, a small event for um, students in grades uh, three, four, and five where they spoke about some memories and then they connected it up with a generations to generation event uh, of uh, lunch and that was, that was absolutely lovely. Um, but just to quickly recap in terms of some of the events that, that we have undertaken in order to help our Reading students feel comfortable as they move over to West. Uh, on May 22nd, uh, Maggie Mills, the principal of Woodstock Elementary School, and John Hansen um, took uh, four fifth graders from Prosper Valley West and went to rest to meet with the students that would be transitioning in. And, and those students were carefully selected as students who had also transferred into that building um, so that they had some experience around what that felt like. Um, this is Mayo, and I, I saw her again today, felt that it, it was really a, a wonderful conversation and that the kids left that conversation uh, saying that they were excited. Um, there was a, again, a transition ceremony today at Reading Elementary School to recognize this, the students moving on to a new building. And um, tomorrow, Mrs. May will ride the bus with students in grades three through five, and so they will spend the morning at Woodstock Elementary Schools. They will get both a tour of the building, they will meet their new teacher for next year, along with their classmates as part of the Step Up Day. Um, also, Principal John Hansen will be at the school tomorrow afternoon and Wednesday evening, so if the students want to bring their family so that they can walk through the school and, and get familiar with that, that is something that's also available to, to them. And then finally, there'll be an open house at West in August where families, parents, and students of all towns are um, invited to tour buildings and meet with teachers and specialists prior to the start of the school year. So I wanted to keep you posted on that. I know that that was a concern for the board that we wish we were careful and thoughtful in terms of those transitions. Um, another piece related to Reading um, had to do with the question that came up around start time. And um, Principal John, John Hansen sent out a communication around start time. He um, shared the information from other schools. And he shared with the community that he, 
he wanted feedback because he said that that it, when he looks at it, it may cause a problem if there's a, a later start time because students would have to get on um, buses at different times. And he was also raising the concern that if you had a parent in two buildings, um, if they both start at the same time, you would have difficulty dropping one off and then the next. The child. The child, yes. Um, so they, he had indicated um, that that he's he want he asked for feedback around it. He said that he did not get a lot of feedback fr from it, but the feedback he did receive, both in writing and in um, conversations, was that people felt that it would probably be best just to keep it at that time. And I don't know I'm not looking for anything other than that, but that's. I gotta say, I didn't get a lot of solicitation for feedback from John. I personally, as a parent, didn't get an email asking for feedback or even a conversation with a board member. I think. Kind of more important than start time for the people, the students and the families in Reading right now is, is this going to somehow on the other end impact any after school viability, right? So we get out, we start earlier, we get out earlier. Parents, families need to know there's going to be a solid after school program throughout the year that we're not going to do three months and decide we only have four kids and we talked about in previous meetings having kind of some consistency and some um, minimums in terms of viability so I think as long as you know at this point it's an early start time there's no way around that people are accustomed to it um, whether they like it or not but having some consistency around after school program I think is is probably more and more on people's minds at this point Anything else there? Um, and so I'm going to continue on if that's okay to just um, follow through information on the I, scan I, I just want to Back up something that Adam just said here. You know, as far as like what the policy committee is trying to do on other issues, is to make sure that it's consistent for next year. So going back to what Adam said, like setting up this after-school program and giving it X amount of months, and if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. I mean, we've put into our budget for a full year. We should be consistent for the full year. We shouldn't like all of a sudden that it drops out then. You know, because there there are families that are making um, decisions, and you know, three months down the road, it's it's canceled, and somebody took a job that mm -hmm. um, <coughs> is just what we're trying to do in policy. We're trying to make sure on certain things that things are consistent for next year, at least in the grading. So when you just said that, it kind of sparked a little something in my head here. Um, so now moving on to the elementary Spanish program, um, as was asked at the, the last meeting, um, I forwarded along the, the information both to the parents who requested it around the recommendations and to the board as well, um, and then trying to outline again where our decision making came from. Um, and again, that we looked at it through a larger lens than the World Language Group was able to do. Um, and that there, there are a couple of, I think, key bullet points around why decisions were made. Um, again, when we entered let the beginning of this year, we had um, special subjects that varied widely across the district. Um, and in merging into a single district and looking at equity, we tried to create a situation in which um, there were standardized specials. Um, so that we looked at students uh, having access to the allied arts that would be equitable across the district, and that um, the then um, looking at kind of being able to outline, okay, here are the K through three, and here are the four through six specials. And that was something that we had discussed um, in our conversations around budget time, particularly as it related to the, the K-3 model in Reading. Um, the, uh, the, um, the findings of the World Study Group was, was the, we looked at the idea of three exposures, um, and that that was something that seemed to be really critical in their piece, um, both from, from talking with Kerry and from talking with the liaison on our, our school leadership team, and that we, we looked at saying, okay, how can we provide that in students in grades four through six? Um, at the same time, we were having conversations regarding concerns about foundational skills 
and the need to provide additional social emotional supports, particularly for younger students. And at this time, not necessarily, not at all indicating that this is a forever piece, that in the grades K through three, um, that we would prioritize those over um, Spanish at this, this moment. Um, there was also consensus that there were ways to give students um, in the younger grades exposure to world language, um, such as some strong uh, digital educational materials. No one is suggesting that digital educational materials um, it, it should take the place or long term replace teachers, certainly not. But in terms of giving kids exposure to language, um, there was a way in which we could do that while we sorted the rest of this out. Um, I, I would also kind of add to that that part of this is looking at our overall curriculum. And, you know, we the board voted to kind of hold off on that work for a year um, while we look at the question of curriculum coordination. Um, so that's certainly something that, that could be an important conversation for next year as we put that goal into place. Um, and then finally, what I would indicate is that um, with this, we also um, are struggling. And not only this district, but numerous districts are struggling to fill these positions with high, high quality teachers. There are not a lot of folks out there. So we, we are currently still working to, to staff the uh, four through six model. Does anybody have any questions before I make a recommendation to you all? Patty. Um, so what have we specifically added or how have we changed the schedule for K through three um, to accommodate this added time? And are our four through six scores not equally problematic that, um, that we are not addressing those those same things that we need to for our K through threes for this concern, um, whether it be in language arts or mathematics or social emotional, are they not going to get those things? I mean, I'm not, I'm not exactly sure. I understand that this is a very intricate um, yeah. uh, trade-off, but I, I'm not exactly, I guess it'd be, I think it might be helpful for us as board members and most certainly for the public who have questions to know exactly how have we changed the schedule for these kids. So you're going to get an extra half hour of math, an extra half hour of, of language arts. Um, I, I, I think if people knew and could see how the curriculum was differently structured for those kids, they may appreciate it more, more than saying that we're just going to address issues that we know um, we're having problems with. Sure, and so the, the short answer to that is it depends on the school because in some schools, you know, you had um, 10 allied arts um, experiences in a week and in some schools you had five and you had them for varying amounts of time. So uh, while I could certainly produce a chart that showed how it all moved across all of the, the schools, one of the things that occurred with the merger is that there were different programs in every school because they were ultimately decided on by the individual boards. So, um, so I, I'm going to talk in broad strokes around that, that um, the, there were some schools that had um, Spanish for, for once a week across all the grade levels. Um, there were some schools that had Spanish for twice a week across all the grade levels. Um, the, the time could vary between the actual school. Um, so again, given the conversations that we had um, and, and reading the report and this idea of multiple exposures being really critical, um, we, we went with the three times 45. And this is that question of balance, right? Because we do actually really value you know, languages and we know that those are, those are important skills for kids to develop. So it, we did not want to not start it in elementary school and give them early exposure to language. Um, so we, we went with the model that was best practice, which was multiple exposures over time. Um, the, the, the question that you are raising in, in terms of, of outcomes, that is again a, a trade-off that we're looking at in terms of um, 
the intervention piece for some students. Um, and the other piece is that the health question is an open question. If you were to think back to the strategic plan, that's one of the questions that we have out there, that how do we, how do we address the social and emotional needs of our students and a, a K-12 health curriculum, and we have that as a strategy um, in the strategic plan. Um, so that will be an ongoing question. Again, health instruction varied widely across the district, um, and, and so we need to look at that. And that's part of the curriculum work that we need to do, um, is to, to look and debate and, and get feedback from all stakeholders about what's, what's most important there. Um, so that's a, 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 a long answer to a question, but it's not as, as simple as it went from this to this, because it really did matter in terms of what school you were in um, and it also it's a balanced question of wanting to um, ensure that kids are getting strong world language exposure um, as recommended with multiple exposures um, and balancing that off with some of the other needs that we have. I just want to point out more than anything, I guess, Mary Beth, a couple times tonight you've said because of the merger when referring to this and allied arts equity, um, but then at the same time you're saying it's not financial. So I would just point out that, um, I mean, equity could be 10 allied arts experiences per week in all schools that would be equitable. So I'm assuming there was some uh, financial aspect and, and saying there wasn't, I think is probably unfair. And uh, I guess I'll bring up Mast over again, um, just because he had, <laughs> he, had, he had asked, I think, Lou, 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 had, Lou had chimed on, I believe, at the time, but um, I, I guess it would have been good if, if, you know, we'd heard this at that time, that we would maybe know some trade-offs that are taking place. Not that we need to make er micromanage every decision, but, you know, language is a pretty big thing. Whether it's language or, or any other subject, I guess I'm just hesitant to change something potentially only for a year. Um, or two, which you've also just stated, so we evaluate, um, and I'm always in, in the feeling of whether it's after school or, or, or busing or Spanish, that um, if you're evaluating something for the time being, it's probably better to leave things in place while you do the evaluation and then move forward um, with whatever you deem proper afterwards, not to make a change, knowing that you don't think it's the best, will you then evaluate it the year and, and then make another change the following year? Because I feel like some kids might miss out on some stuff. Thank you. So um, I, I think kind of where I started is I'm very sensitive to the idea that you need to put time into certain areas in K-3. I am also worried though that you know you look at the research and biliterate students and how they perform in all of the subject areas where we want students to excel mm -hmm. and they're performing better. Um, and that is you know pretty consistent by the research and I know these are very difficult trade-offs but at the same time I have a little bit of a hard time understanding how working more on social and emotional issues in K-3 is what we have to do instead of, you know, some K-3 Spanish instruction, right? And, and I know there's, you know, there are best recommendations coming from experts out there that say, you know, multiple exposures a week, but I think that sometimes if we can't meet that bar, we should try to meet at least some bar. And this is excluding the fact that we haven't been able to hire a Spanish teacher, right? And so that, that impacts this conversation. But, you know, outside of that, you know, I'd really like to see us consider how can we offer something, right? Whatever that might be. And, and I know that's hard to do, but I think it's important to the community because I've heard it multiple times now from different people, not just at this meeting. And I think, um, you know, when our community values that, that's what we should be responsive to. Um, I just want to thank everyone for coming this evening and the community members who spoke out so eloquently and gave us their, their feedback. And I also am hearing a lot about this um, across the gamut. And I, I'm really concerned and disappointed at the thought of a foreign language not being taught from K through three. And I, it sounds to me like the process by which that decision was made was really a flawed process that first got these wonderful recommendations from foreign language teachers and and from Elena who we should all point out is also a foreign language teacher just not in, in the district so in her role there was as a as a board member but still coming with that breadth and depth of knowledge um, of, a, of a foreign language teacher and it really bothers me that the final decision was made without their voices was just by the, the leadership team without the, the principals 
to at least have them at the table to say we can't do these wonderful recommendations that you suggested right now so what is the next best thing to me that would have been a much more genuine and and rich way to to make these decisions i'm also i, I don't want to sound critical to our principals because they work so hard but i'm just disappointed that none of them are here tonight also so that the elementary school principals garen i love seeing you, Thank you. <laughs> um, Thank you garen. so that we could also <coughs> hear um hear a little bit more from them about why they made this trade-off. So to me, that's really disappointing. Um, Many, just so you know, Claire, many of them are at- um, Graduate graduation. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm there's listening. There's Again, I, it wasn't meant as a criticism, it was just this sort of a, district, you know, their voices would be valuable in this conversation. Um, so I, I guess, you know, I'm looking here at what other districts are doing, and I'm seeing that in Lyme, kindergarten has Spanish three times a week for 15 minutes, you know, and I'm sort of whispering over to here, Milena, you know, what do you think of, 15 minutes three times a week so I, I'd love for your opinion I mean to me it seems hard to believe that we couldn't find something for K through 3 and I am totally against putting kids in front of screens for something like this I just I, mean, I have a lot to say about this I know I've had many conversations <laughs> with a lot of people um, and so I, I I mean I my I have yes I'm a teacher and I also have a linguistics background so I'm I also am, you know, a native speaker of Spanish, and I learned English and French. So, I, I've been through the process of learning throughout my entire life of the different languages, and I know the benefits. And I know Claire, you could probably speak to this too of the elasticity of the brain and what happens from zero to nine, especially. So, I agree with everything that everybody's saying here on, you know, the disservice that I think we're doing to our kids by not exposing them to language at those early stages. Um, and what benefits it can have for all types of students, not just mainstream, you know? So, so it <laughs> I get very passionate. <laughs> but, um, you know, so when I hear, you know, Bryce talking about, you know, the consolidation and then talking about how, um, you know, we're, we don't need to go above and beyond, but we're taking away. Mm -hmm. So what can we do, especially from a budget standpoint, we've had some movement is there anything we can do? You know, and yes, there is a shortage of teachers, language teachers in our area, but I just interviewed three today at KMS, and they were great. <laughs> you know, so they're out there. You and know, I so agree with what Matt said. It doesn't have to be Spanish. I mean, yeah. could French K-3 and then it Spanish. It should, you know, it should be in yeah. line to wherever we have in the high school, you know, middle school. It should have a vision. It should have continuity. But yeah, it does right. not have to be, you know, one language so so there's I think that we can be creative and we can make this work and I think when you take something away in any situation it's really hard to elegantly get it back um, and so I, I just am really concerned I, I think it gets messy it gets messy it takes a long time uh, you know I, I just I think it would be a huge mistake to to follow through with with what's currently being done and I you know we still have all summer I find it hard to believe we can't fix this in some way shape or form that's my two cents um Claire touched upon a lot of what I was going to say and I was just going to piggyback on to what Lou was saying a little bit about you know there's got to be there's got to be a happy medium about them just taking it away completely you know why can't we just at least keep doing what we're doing like one day a week you know um rather than just keep t just continuing like take away I also understand what you know staffing and how difficult that can be in this area but. Yeah, a couple things to, <coughs> to be mindful of around that. Um, one is that if we are moving in the direction of trying to restore K through 3 we have situations where we would probably have somebody traveling a half hour to ready to provide 50 <coughs> minutes of language and then traveling a half an hour back um, three times a week. Um, you're probably looking at adding just for probably once a week. I, you know, we looked at if you did all three, it's about 2.0 FTE. Um, and what what I need the board to understand is that each time you say, well, we should be able to figure out something like this. We should be able to figure out something for the after school program. And we should be able to figure out something for, for this situation. We should be able to figure out something for that situation. You're right. If they were single items, 
we should be able to figure it out. But I, I do want to caution the board, um, and certain, excuse me, certainly we'll do whatever the, the board directs us to do, but as you keep adding these things on, if you are doing everything, you are doing nothing wrong. And we are mindful of the fact that we, we did not take away any Spanish instruction, we moved it and we made it more intensive in the upper grades. This will throw off, this will be a, 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 another piece in a very complicated um, system right now. And if you tell us you want us to make it happen, then we will make it happen. But there are a lot of these things coming at it. And as your superintendent, I'm going to tell you that the number of things that we, that the board is asking us to manage, and we know you expect us to manage it well, at some point we get to the place where we are sped through too thin and we are trying to do too many things that we can deliver well to you. Um, and, uh, and again, we will certainly take whatever direction you give us, but I do want to offer that caution. Adam? Um, and Jim, you'll be the last to comment. So I appreciate, you know, you're asking for um, some discussion in terms of kind of the workload we put on your plate. Um, but you use the word we, and I think that, w you know, my experience in Vermont, we is, is not just this board and the senior administration, it's the community. Um, and the, the community can collaborate and, and come up with this together, that it doesn't have to be you single-mindedly or the senior leadership making this final decision, you know. Um, maybe at this point we're, we're kind of constrained based on budgetary issues or ability to hire, you know, enough positions at this, at this point. But how many people are bilingual in this room, right? We could take a, a show of hands. I majored in Spanish, I'm bilingual, you know, I'm not volunteering you to do more, but <laughs> we have an amazing retiring Spanish teacher, right? I'm not volunteering you to come back. But let's be creative, I mean, you said it multiple times, Melina, Let, let's be creative and resigning to just more screen time is, is I agree with everybody, who's, is, is not acceptable, right? Um, but also really kind of capitalizing that there's, you know, what, um, I think pr produces the most effective uh, and sustainable results is when decisions are made in a collaborative fashion. And what I'm taking from the conversation tonight, the conversation last week, is that the general consensus is that thi things don't feel like they were made in a, a collaborative fashion. And that's where um, a lot of the angst is, is coming from tonight and uh, this movement we're making right now. Jim and then Bob. <laughs> so, what I'm hearing tonight is, is that um, Carrie and Melina and the whole group put together some kind of report. And I'm hearing that the superintendent and um, the principals made this decision. Well, um, this is a follow through information on elementary Spanish program. The last meeting that we had when we spoke about this, I sat here over there. And I had said, I do not recall this being in a board meeting. And I was assured that it was, and I asked for the minutes of saying, when you brought this to this board to say that Spanish was being dropped from for K through three, I specifically asked for the minutes. And I would have expected that today, in this follow through, that there would be the minutes showing that this board had it in front of them and voted on it because I said I was either not here, I had to have not been here for this, but now tonight what I'm hearing is that it was not in front of this board, it was a decision in administration. So I'm just lost like last month, and this is what I really have a problem with sitting on this board. I really do. That when something goes wrong in this town or in this school district, we are the first ones to get blamed. And now it's been pushed further from the community, and thank you, because what you're really doing here tonight is you push something that's showing that 
last month you were underneath the belief because I was underneath the belief too. I was not here when you folks voted on this. And now tonight I'm finding out that we had nothing to do with it. So thank you because I'm, I, I know I missed one, maybe two meetings and I thought maybe to myself, you know, I believe in a vote is a vote and that's why I asked for the minutes. They can't be, they cannot be presented because it was not put to this board. We found that out tonight. And I would just go further that if any other programs are planned to get dropped, that that is something huge to this community. And it should be brought up to the board so it can be put in minutes, so we could be liable, so it doesn't fall on the administration. I mean, I'm just shocked that, you know, we're all sitting going around and around and around and it's a follow through and yet we spent 40 minutes at the last meeting telling me that I voted for this. And thank you. I didn't and I wouldn't have. I truly believe that we need language from kindergarten up. And if we can go out and afford and this is not a knock against this new school, but if we can afford to go out and talk about building a 50 to 70 million dollar school, we can't get from a 1.7 to a 2.0 to have Spanish in our school. That's crazy. I've said enough. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, Jim, just to make sure that I'm clarifying for the 2.0, it would be an additional 2.0. Okay, so we um, can't afford a 2.0. We can't so afford two teachers, but we're going to go out. And I think it's great that we're going out to find a way of building a new school. So don't take me wrong on that part, folks. But if we can do that, we can't bring on um, 2.0. Um, my, my concern is that we uh, end up in a situation where there's a whole bunch of parents who've uh, lost a year of K-3 language education because I can almost clearly see that we're going to spend a year and we're going to put it back. So I'm kind of with Bryce. I think we ought to hang on to what we've got, study it, and then if we make changes, make them over a long, another, another year. Of, uh, you know, recommendations, but in the meantime, I don't, I don't think we should drop it only to, I expect, be able to put it back. If I, if I could just quickly, because there are, there are a couple things that were said here this evening that are troubling to me as a leader. Um, one is regarding collaboration. Um, and I, I have to say that I worked really hard with the world language group that we looked at this particular issue. I will tell you that there are a hundred things going on and people can forget and I looked up emails to be sure that I, I was not incorrect in my rec my recollection of this. That this group was, was involved in terms of being kept in the loop about what we were deciding and why we were deciding it. Um, there have probably been a, you know, 200 major decision or decisions like this all the time that we have had to make. And we make them as collaboratively as we possibly can. And when we were in the midst of a very complicated budget process, I did bring this to the board. Um, and what I would certainly say is in the huge budget process, was this something that was highlighted? No, but it was discussed. And, and again, we work to serve the community and the board, but I will take issue with the fact that I was not upfront with this board about what was happening, and I will take <coughs> issue with the fact that we do not operate in the collaborative. <coughs> I'll take to offense that last month I was told that we voted on this and we did not. That's it. Okay. You may have said it to us in some way. But it was not a vote, and last month I was told there was a vote here. So my recommendation, after listening to everybody speak tonight in the last meeting and reading the recommendations from the committee, um, I think that 
we need to proceed, or my recommendation is to proceed the way it has been planned for the following year. My recommendation is, is there any way that teachers can become involved in morning meeting perhaps, and I'm trying to just think creatively, in helping these littles learn how to count, learn how to talk about colors, days of the weeks, months of the year, et cetera, et cetera. I don't know because I'm not the educator. But if there is some way that we could put the beginnings of language introduction into a morning meeting session, I think that will help us so that it gives us the next year. And I will state that I think, I think that we should add to make an amendment to our one year plan is that we need to reevaluate this decision and what we want to do for the next year. Um, because it will affect budget. It will affect looking for talented language teachers. And I think that we need to do that sooner than later because that's been a huge challenge for us in the district is to find really great language teachers on all levels, K through 12. Um, I think the talent we already have in the district and have had in the district has been phenomenal. Um, I think that if we're going to support the bioliteracy diploma, then we need to support it 100% K through 12 and not just 4 through 12. However, budget, time, and decisions have been made for our next year coming up. That's not to say that we can't get creative in the lower grades with the existing teachers that are there. Um, so that is my recommendation to you as a group. If you do not want to follow that recommendation, then we will have to meet again and talk about this further and have a special vote of how we're going to proceed because it will affect the budget that has been approved and it will affect the hiring situation and the teachers that are not currently hired within the district. Because it, we will have to get additional teachers. Um, I think that people should mull over this conversation from the board, respond back to Jennifer and myself of how you would like to proceed and we will follow up with you if we feel that they, we need to make a very big change in our direction for next fall. Can I just ask a technical question? Yes. Since the budget's been approved, is there like some kind of discretionary funds or something? No, How that work? there are not. We would have to make cuts in other areas. I see. <coughs> Can we proceed now? I, I would just say that since we have a huge group of citizens input here on this subject for us now to go into a to, to drop this discussion and to go into a private discussion with the co-chairs is not serving the community well and I believe that we should we are board members we all put our names in to be voted and if it means that we have to be back here for another meeting to continue this conversation it should be in the public Oh, it, it would be. It would be a public meeting to discuss it further, but I need to know. Well, you just said for us to, to have our individual conversations or whatever with you and Jennifer. No, I didn't say private conversations. I asked the board if they want to have a special meeting to discuss this at greater length and to take another vote. Okay, to I'll make a motion that we have a special meeting on this subject and just this subject. So that everybody that's interested on this subject only can be here as the public. Could, could I just suggest if we're going to have policy second readings that we could potentially tack it on the same because second readings are not yeah. usually involved meeting. Yeah. So yeah. I'll take this amendment. <laughs> 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 second. Second. All those in favor of the motion on the table say aye. Okay. Aye. aye. All those opposed. Okay, we'll have a special meeting. Hey, would it would be possible to get the parameters of what we're talking about, knowing that the calendar is aggressive, the market's tough, um, and that we're working within a budget that has already been passed by the voters. Correct. Even with those constraints, is it possible for Mary Beth and Richard and team to come back with what might be possible? Sure. Okay. Good. Good.
I'm also just thinking through Paige your suggestion of some creative solutions that don't involve reworking the budget and is that something we could ask someone to create before the meeting <laughs> or who's going to brainstorm that idea who like because like, that you talking like volunteers from the no <laughs> no where would those where would those creative ideas come from and I think it would be important that the public and the board knew what those creative ideas were because that could be a plan B so we will take all of your comments and Jennifer and I will meet with Mary Beth to plan the agenda and the commentary and what we will provide for you I would think that we could reach out to the community as we are and maybe to the schools and there are some schools that teach Spanish that people are getting their teachers licenses and maybe we can pull somebody in that it will do some of their time or whatever for, for uh, volunteer okay. and that's something that has to come up I'm going to continue the conversation um, we know what the directive is as both co-chairs and superintendent and we will follow through with that and then we will set a special meeting date for the end of June for both policy and this topic all right um, continuing on in the superintendent's report um, you have the 2019 post-graduation plans as of June 5th <coughs> so you have that for our graduating seniors and then some statistics around the, the number of people who are confirmed in terms of going to work <coughs> in terms of the gap year military <coughs> excuse me and plans that have not yet Take a drink of water I know. <laughs> Then, as you see here, <laughs> you have the Director of Instructional Technology Report and the Report for Instructional Support Services. Um, summary <coughs> to expense budget is um, linked, so you've got that in the link. And then finally, our 1924 work plan is there for you, um, should you use it. Thank you very much, ma'am. <laughs> And I think that that is that wraps you up. Do I have a motion on the table to approve the consent agenda? Second. 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 Does anybody have any questions, concerns, thoughts? All those in favor of approving the motion on the table, say aye. 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 All those opposed? The motion is passed. Uh, so the following um, topics are um, to approve each topic that we have discussed at great length in previous meetings as well as our retreat. Um, I'm trying to get to the page. Hold on a second. I can't see that. It's page 53. Thank you. Okay, so the first, um, do I have a motion on the table to, <coughs> let's see, a motion on the table for the board to vote to endorse the Campus Configuration Committee's recommendation to pursue evaluating the financial feasibility of the district-wide facility improvement plan for the following reasons. Yada, 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 yada. Um, do I have a motion on the table? Do I have a second? Second. Thank you. Does anybody have any further questions or clarifications that are needed before the vote? Did we want to include a deadline for uh, for coming up with the? Well, we financial. had stated that there should be a calendar when it's. Uh, when the committee goes back to the table to pr to put together a calendar, correct? I mean, that was discussed at the yeah, retreat. This committee's plan following what would be an endorsement of the concept would be to come back with a sort of schedule for the next phases. Correct. And this certainly has been two years of study for sure, and, and um, I'm as impatient as anyone. Um, with uh, a promise to a daughter that I've mentioned this before that she'd have uh, a fantastic place to come back to for her class reunions. <laughs> <laughs> Nonetheless, she's senior, she's graduated. But, um, so I, I'm, I'm very impatient, but um, uh, it's hard 
it's hard, you know, I can only sort of see one phase at a time. I think the next phase is obviously a critical one, and that's trying to put together the financing. So it's just hard to understand how much private financing may or may not be part of this picture. It's hard to know what the state can and cannot do for us. That said, I would love nothing more than for this board to be comfortable to come back with a fully formed package that we think is doable to put before the voters in March. Would love that. Um, I don't. I, I don't know. I don't know what what's ahead of us, other than a lot of hard work and a lot of communication to, to the communities, to to you know to inform them about the need for this project. So I'm 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 willing to take. I'm willing to take a date. I don't know how we would couch that, or or uh, I don't have certainty in a date, but I underst I understand the impatience. Could we could we because I, I kind of mentioned last meeting, but it's it's almost two separate timelines, right? The actual event of it happening, and then our schedule for these. And I feel much more comfortable setting a time this fall where we could commit to presenting <laughs> what's happened to date and and make it early enough that it's before that time. It, you know, this is so we could come up with the time frame this fall where we could say this is where we're at so far, this is what we've learned, and, and have a more formal. I know we're on this, the schedule anyway, but if we wanted to put something um, more black and white What's into this. State that you have yeah, if I could speak to that. So in our um, one-year strategic plan um, that is built off of the five-year strategic plan, we have um, five presentations set for the board. Um, regarding this particular priority area. So one is on September 9th, one is on uh, November 23rd, one is on January 27th, the f and the fourth is on March 23rd. So there, there are four dates that are already in the calendar dedicated to this particular issue, and then the last one is in May, in, on May 26th. So what we could look to do is to align um, some of those presentations with these placeholders that we already have. Yeah. We met a Saturday morning and basically we're all in agreement to vote yes for the next part is evaluating the fe financial feasibility of this. We did not go through saying that we were going to have it set up for an exact vote this March. We need to have the numbers mm -hmm. to see if the numbers work. There were questions that were brought up at that meeting on Saturday that now this group is going to be charged with. One, a timetable. Mm -hmm. Okay, two, what does it mean for each and every town? And what if a town does not have the borrowing capacity of what would be allocated to them? And what is the, what will be the split amongst? This is a this is a district. This is going to be. I mean, it's not new because it was done once before. But you know, we uh, Woodstock School here was built. I'm sure with all the towns. But we have to find out what the costs are and everything else. And we have to be upfront with everyone. So to come out of here tonight saying we're going to say this is going to be voted on in March. I mean, I think that's just jumping the gun. We need to have all the information in front of us. For everyone here to feel comfortable of saying yes, so the let's price makes let's sense. Let's move with the vote then on what we had written the original resolution to be, and we had all we have all agreed to that resolution. And then the committee will come back with their schedule when they have their first presentation. Correct, and the rush yep. is on them to get the timetable done. Correct, Pamela. Um, so I'm not even sure if this would be part of the process at this point yet, but I just wanted to say that um, in case it is, I, I do want to be sure that we have a, um, a good, uh, thorough conversation about the sixth grade issue. And I know that a lot of times with new construction, um, the cost of it is discussed in terms of per pupil. I think it would be healthy for us if we are going to have that kind of calculation to have a per pupil, uh, you know, figures around uh, seven through twelve and six through twelve, uh, so that there's there's not a sense that we're jumping into moving sixth grades before which, we've which actually talked have about it. Had those conversations? No, I mean us as yeah. a board. Yeah. yeah, and that when we see the figures, that that there's not a presumption that sixth grade is moving. Correct. There is, there is no presumption. No, That's there great. is no presumption. Um, so. All those in favor of the motion on the table say aye. 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 All those opposed? The motion passes. Thank you.
profile of a graduate. Do I have a motion on the table to approve the profile of a graduate? Do I have a second? Does anybody have any questions? Okay. So I, I just want to let you know that based on the feedback that you offered at the retreat, there have been a couple of changes to this document. One is instead of looking at critical problem solving, we've identified that particular area as critical thinking and problem solving. Um, we added the um, piece around digital citizen skills. Uh, linked to a definition of growth mindset and added in values and performed civic duties all as an outcome of our meeting on Saturday. Melina? <laughs> Based on today's conversation, I'd like to propose that we think about adding somewhere in here a phrase that includes biliteracy. Um, I know we have global environment in here. Um, but is there, I'm sorry, but I cannot right now for the life of me think of an eloquent sentence to add to this, but just. <laughs> oh, come on, kids. No. Yeah. Can I just ask one question? Dear, are students required to take foreign language? No. Yeah. They're not. No. In Vermont, in the high school, there's no. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The graduation? Huh. No. Okay. So that's a choice. It's a choice, but is it our school? So we just had a whole conversation about <laughs> We about have chosen school that culture. languages are important to our school. Yeah. But it is not, it is a choice of the student to participate okay. in language, the arts, music, um, those yeah. areas. That does not have to be in here. They, okay. they, but they have to choose something in that. Areas, right. yeah. there, right. are, there are, our requirements are additional literature requirements that can be fulfilled through language mm -hmm. so it's not an explicit requirement but it's embedded in the general requirements. Mm -hmm. I would I would think that on I mean, the academic excellence which was one of the other I think it was it said there should be a common between technology rich and global environment you never said that global environment to to have the ability to navigate yeah I mean in the future world I would think Oh, it leaves you space yeah. there for if for some reason the school wants to add in that language is is a must or whatever in high school or whatever or it gives you that there. So that's why we put that common right. Okay. All those in favor of the motion on the table say aye. 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 All those opposed? The ayes have it. The motion is passed. So you want me to make a motion to approve the five year strategic plan? Yes. <laughs> so I can second it. <laughs> Thank you. Any questions? I, I missed what we were just saying. Five year plan. Do you want to go through some of the changes that were made? Yes. Uh, so you. just to, um, you have a lot here. So yeah, we're at 57 now. Um, one of the things that I that has changed since we met on Saturday is that we were able to get some of the specific data from our district from the National Student Clearinghouse. Um, so I've included that in the, the opening pieces. We had a placeholder for that. So um, percent of Woodstock Union High School Middle School students enrolled in any college at any time after the first year of high school. Um, in 2016 it was 72%, in 2017 it was 67%, and in 2018 it was 54%. Um, and then the percentage of our graduates that completed a degree within six years, according to the National Student Health Clearinghouse, 2011, and you remember this is a six-year cohort, so that's why you're only getting um, two years. Class of 2011, 46 completed their degree within six years, and in class of 2012, 58% completed their degree within um, six years. So, so I just have a question for you. Mm -hmm. Since we don't have 11 and 12 up above, okay. is that 46 percent of the total students that were in the school for 2011, or is that 46 percent of the students that went on to college? It's 46 percent of those that went on to college. Oh, so more wow. than half drops out of college. No, up to 50 percent. Of the 50 yeah, yeah, 50 percent. 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 Only 57 percent are Where 70 percent? And that's when you look at that. Well, yeah, if 57 percent enrolled, 57 percent enrolled. That 57 percent becomes 100 percent, and if only 46 percent completed, so 
I mean, that, that's math, folks. If 57% of your total school, 100 people in this school went on, and out of that, 57 kids went on to college out of 100, that's 57% enrolled in college. And then that 57 children become 100%, and six years later, 46% of them completed. So half of 57 is just 28 and a half. Is that the intent of how this is written, that the, the college sample is graduating at a 46% rate, or is it intended that's 46% of the sample being all of the students in that cohort of classes? I mean, Okay. Yeah, that's so. Yeah, so it's it's over that six year time period. That's how they report that out. So it includes every student that graduated from high school in that group, or every student that went to college. I think that's Jim's question. It says class of 2011. Yeah, class it, it, of 2011. 57 percent of a class of 2011 enroll. How yeah, many kids yeah, were in 2011? Right. So that 57 becomes 100. I mean, this is, we shouldn't be talking about this for a long time. There was a hundred and something kids that graduated in 2011, and 57%, so 57 kids went. That 57% becomes a hundred that went on, and then only 46% of that, so less than half. So 28 kids, if there was a, if there was a hundred kids. I, if it, I want to just clarify, because if you, it says of, of the middle school, high school class, that completed a degree within six years. So 57% actually enrolled in a school and uh, and 46 actually completed their degree. That's in the class it's of 2011. Not, it's not 46%. So only 11%. 46% of the kids. Right. Right. So, so that, 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 it's just written poorly. Right. It's just written poorly. Is it 46%? Okay, we're going to move on. So, you know. Yeah, let's forget about that. <laughs> so just giving, you know, when we look at that, I think that it, it's helpful data. We'll be able to track this over time, and it relates to our, our student success goals. But this is something that we, we just recently received and wanted to add it into the document. There had been a placeholder there. I think it's helpful to just, it, it'd be helpful to get national trends too, like the comparison of purpose. Yeah. And the report we got was actually quite lengthy and robust, and we, we simply just haven't had the time to unpack it yet, yeah. but I think it's going to be really important for us to take a deep dive into it and do that kind of analysis that you're suggesting. Um, I did want to just call your attention to a rewording, rewording of strategy 1.2. Um, that there is a, that we originally had talked about addressing the decline in math proficiency and we just rewrote this um, to be a little bit more to the positive um, and to achieve a high level of math proficiency for all students through curriculum review, classroom instructional practices, professional development and robust interventions. Um, so there's just a slight wording change um, that um, had a, it kind of spoke more about it in a positive light than a negative light. Um, then I want to call your attention. There was a conversations about uh, school within a school being a concept that people may may not understand. So there was some rewording there uh, to establish a second high school campus that provides a learning experience embedded in a community organization or business. So that school within a school language was taken out, um, and there was also a, a comment about. Many people will not know what that the C3 program is, so there was a definition embedded in there, um, and a little bit more clarity in terms of the system of recruitment. And I believe those are the, the pieces that we captured. Any questions? All those in favor with the motion on the table, say aye. Aye. All those opposed? I have a motion for the 1920 strategic plan goals for the next year. So moved. Second. Thank you. Any questions? Any changes? The I, I have a question. Yeah. Um, under student success, I was just thinking um, 
The wording sounded a little defeatist, uh, and I was wondering if it could be changed to say, like, begin implementing portrait of a graduate work by prioritizing by prioritizing math curriculum, because I think that that is part of the portrait of a graduate, a profile of a graduate, I can't remember which the P, the P stands for, but I do think that's part of the work is improving math scores, and I just think that would also be a more positive way to frame it and also would give credence to the, all the work that's been done on the profile of the Say graduate. Say it one more time, Claire. Um, begin implementing POG work by prioritizing math curriculum. Which one is the one? The one student success. Yeah, it says that before the district can embark on more in-depth curriculum work that includes. Well, I, I was going to say before it should be just wiped out. Yeah, I feel like the, it the should just say begin the implementing the work. Embark on more in-depth yeah. curriculum. Because I feel like it just makes it sound defeatist instead of like that we're we're going to start working on this. Yeah, and it's this almost is like how. an excuse yeah. right. before right like before we can embark. Right, no, I just feel like we're embarking, embarking and this, we're starting with math. Yeah, let's let's go. Let's with saddle up. I think that <laughs> the word urgency and all of that is there because of prior board conversations that we had, so it's reflecting that. So I don't know if this is the right document for it or not, but I understand why it's there. Yeah, I just think there's a way to say it that that makes us all, that indicates that prioritizing the math is still embracing the work of Portrait for Web. The all. district will. That was my, that was my sentiment are. there. Okay. And then the, the piece that you have there still has the old language, but we would put the new language in that. So are we changing the before to the district will embark? Yeah, I have the district will embark on, on mm -hmm. more in-depth Whoever made the motion, can you I did. It? Thank you. And I make the amendment. Okay. I'll second the Thank amendment. You. Second. Second. All those in favor of the motion on the table say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion's passed. Policy, take over. Okay. So, so I'm just going to give a little overview looking at the, um, the agenda. Um, I want to point out that the first one that we're going to do is our, the final reading of, um, I think it's our final reading, uh, Age of Entrance that we've talked about before. The state made a small change. So there's not much for us to converse about or, or debate because it's a state mandated uh, tweak. Two months ago, we all had big discussions. We had all big conversation on this. The folks gave us some questions. We went back, we answered them, and we were ready to approve it. And then the state came in and added some other language to Sorry, which one? Five year old. Okay, that's the first yeah, one. That's the first mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. So why don't we just do like one at one one? I'm gonna make a motion. We need a motion, right, Raina? For the yeah. age of entrance to be approved. approved. Okay. So I'll make huh? that motion. I'll second. Any other questions, questions or discussion? Out. <laughs> no. Do we all understand that we had like a long conversation and blah, 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 blah? Yeah, you're approving at the next meeting or you're approving now? We're approving, we're approving now, now, right? Okay. Yeah, this is we've the second reading. Yeah, yeah, we've already spoken. So any, more, any conversation? Excuse me? No conversation. Oh, all those in favor of the motion on the table. We were discussing cake. Aye. 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 Three, and actually let's pretend that grade restructuring is there too. So these four policies, um, grade restructuring, we're going to work on tomorrow, and that will be in the special meeting, so you all know that. But those all go together and build on each other. So um, if you read it, you, you saw that they start to refer to each other. They start with the annual report policy. Um, uh, then that annual report of the sort of educational and fiscal health of each campus will have the superintendent give a recommendation to the board every spring. Um, the recommendation might be no action. Hopefully will often be no action because everything's going great. Um, but that will um, sort of formalize the, uh, our, our understanding and, and awareness of what's going on throughout the buildings and throughout the schools. Um, so the next policy then is the campus sustainability. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 sure. The annual so we're sort of just leaving it open-ended enough with just 
asking for a report on student outcomes. So what I'm going to do here is just make a motion to approve the first reading of the annual report policy. Yes. Are you second it? Second. Okay. Now, what's your yes. question? Now, I, I just wanted you know you included um, enrollment. That's uh, that's evident enough. Financial information. I guess that's the cost per pupil kind of yeah. numbers. And then student outcomes, are there particular things we're looking for in an annual report? Do we, and we don't feel that we need to put any more um, clarification in there. We'll just. We've had a conversation with the administration, uh, a lengthy conversation about what it means. Yeah. I don't think we need to put it into a policy. Yeah. But maybe in the future. What you, we'll what's the right thought now. of what it means? We want, I mean, we talked to Hannah about this too. Um, we want more than just. Um, Standardized testing, yes, but that is important. Um, what was that? I don't know it's the actually language. actually in the... Uh, it's in the it, policy it, itself. Although we, we, that was part of what I wanted to talk about tomorrow, so we may want to hold on that. Okay. Um, but if you look at the campus sustainability um, piece, it talks about enrollment, it talks about financial information, and it talks about student outcome data. So that I would bring forth, or the, the superintendent yeah. would bring forth the um, the data and um, so that the board could see that and the this is and then maybe I'll let you speak to the yeah. so basically we'll jump just to answer your question yeah. if you go to student outcomes yeah. okay. and it breaks out the elementary school okay standardized testing should not be below it should be should yeah. not be 20 percent below the elementary school averages and the district's benchmarking assessments are showing student growth scores that are below the 50th percentile that was the thing that Hannah had brought up that it's in here. If you go on to the middle school, high school, then I tend to not be below the 70th percentile for the state. And but that's just standardized testing. You know, and the district's <laughs> benchmarking assessment. The best so benchmarking. Okay. Okay. These are like that's the principle. So, so, so they have that benchmark. Test. So we're talking about so the so star I exam. Just, and, and the idea behind it, I know, was we wanted to recognize both outcomes and growth. And to give both some recognition within the policy because you know, we're not always going to get everybody the outcome they want, but to also look at growth. So, trying to create a balanced policy moving forward that's fair to all involved. Um, so, I mean, with the, with all of the the four policies that all have to do with the health of the schools, we wanted to um, we wanted them to create a situation where there's consistency, where there's fairness, um, and that there there are processes laid out that everybody understands and could expect in certain situations so that we reduce the chances of um, surprises or you know that that sort of thing in the future and we wanted to show that it was in steps so that's why we broke it out um, three at least on right here right and looking so at like a structured way to look at every school that's fair right it's not different by school we're not making different a single board now so we need a single structured way to evaluate the health of a school but also give a school that maybe isn't succeeding in all these factors enough time to work on those issues and for the board to help them with those issues, not that we can always solve them, but I think it creates a system by which we begin to understand how is everybody doing and what do we need to do, and then eventually you can move into other steps, but I think this is the fairest way to move forward. And I think just to, to slightly disagree with that or, or just say that we came to a compromise where yes, we I agree with Lou, but we also didn't make the numbers and other factors so tight that every school has to be exactly the same. We understand that there are some circumstances where one school might cost a little bit more, but that there are limits. Yeah. Oh. I don't think I disagree to, um, with that in any way. Do we have so. to make a motion to discuss this further? We already did. The annual report is already a motion. Yeah, but we're already talking about we're on another issue. No, no. We're, we're going to go. Through, let's go through one by one. This is just an no. annual report. We'll come back. To we're just talking about that. And okay. all this is saying is that the, the superintendent Okay. is going to give us an annual report each year by April of telling us and breaking out each school in our district as far as the, um, the, the enrollment, the financial, and the student outcomes. Okay? So each year by April you will be getting that. So we'll get a second reading of this at our... So let's vote on all four of them for a second reading. Wait, are we talking? Can I comment on the campus sustainability policy? Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> okay, but we're voting on that for them? Or I no? mean, what I'm trying to no, say okay. here, folks, is I'll be okay with yeah. this first policy. I just, want Don't, just because they're all linked into each other's, we, this is like 
We just voted on an age of student. We have a we have a motion on the table right now for the annual report. Right. Can we agree that that should be, or you want changes to it? Are we good with the annual report? Okay. That's all I'm asking. All those in favor of the motion on the table, say aye. 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 All those opposed. They've approved the first reading. We're moving on to the now. I will reading. make a motion to approve the first reading of the campus sustainability policy. Second. Aye. Now is all your questions. And any panel, I just said, repeat in your heads. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, my question is just based upon being formerly being on the policy committee, and um, we were a lot of the former policies that were put in place this year were um, very policy driven and had very little to do with procedure. And I'm just wondering if these ones if it's typical for them to be this lengthy and involve this much procedure if that's typical for these specifically it is okay we, we, we pulled I'm out just, no we kidding. pulled out other schools policies that was way more some of them were seven pages eight nine yeah pages okay long. so this is this is a so very the, the policies that you worked on for the first year yeah on that original policy committee group mm -hmm. were standard policies that either were set by the state mm -hmm. or nationally set yeah. or or school-wide had to be in place by the yeah. end of the first year of our merge yeah. and that's why they were much more simple yeah. and they only took up one page and they mm -hmm. didn't necessarily include included procedures that may have been attached to them or more in-depth details yeah. of what that policy meant. Okay. Now we're getting into policies policy. that are more in-depth than in context and may include procedures or not procedures. Yeah. But I'm, just, I'm literally just hearing Dan French in my ear being like, don't put procedures and policies, don't put procedures and policies. We, we, drew, we, had to, we <laughs> tried to draw a really clear line, well, right, mm -hmm. between like procedure and policy. Mm -hmm. So everything you're gonna see here are things that we think should be in policy with a full understanding that procedure is something different, okay. right? So there are times when we may move a procedure to policy for specific reasons, but we're trying not to do that. Also, I, I'd like to add that we, we worked with Mary Beth on this policy, on all of these policies, but, but in particular this one, a lot of these, like the enrollment, um, that came from Mary Beth's recommendation. And these aren't really um, procedures in the sense, uh, in, in a way, these are thresholds. Okay. You know, and so they're defining thresholds so that we have that clarity. Yeah, yeah. No, that, that answers my question. Yeah. And I just want to clear up. I went to that same meeting that Dan French was at, and Dan French did say that there are some policies that you will have to include mm -hmm. procedures into. Well, there so. are numerous meetings that Dan French was at. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. Patty, next. Okay. Um, I have multiple questions. You want them one at a time, or you want them one at a time? One. <laughs> um, so the the reasoning behind the slightly higher number per. Yeah, total number of kids at a K through three versus a K through six, if I'm doing my math correctly. Yes. Um. Right, because seven times eight would be. You mean a higher number of students per grade? Well, the total number is student. It's never by grade because it's. But no, I'm just saying, like you're looking at the average, is what you're saying. Right. Because right? 56 is 134, no matter what. No, so I'm looking at the average. So it's right. eight per class. In a K through six, it's a little bit over eight per class. In a K through three, so none of it's is that five grades, right? Five well, K through three is thirty-four <coughs> students, <coughs> and it's forty students, including the district pre-K. Well, so seven times eight is fifty-six, right? Mm -hmm. Four times eight. No. Yes. Okay. Would be 32. Was that probably? Would 34. be 32 instead of 34. I think what should be here is like there's th th that A K. I mean, it's saying a K to six school will be defined as a school of enrollment of at least 56 56 students. So there's seven grades there. We jumped it up for 10 students to 66 students, including the district pre K. That's not my question. Yeah, no, Patty's saying it's eight students is the average on a K through three, eight point five. No, eight students. students is the average on a K through six. And it's, it's slightly higher <laughs> yeah. in a no, K through I three. I, I can't recall how we talked about this a lot and I can't I can't the recall the that level. She told me maybe it's a mistake. That there's a certain amount of cost with the building. 
right? And so it doesn't matter what you do. There's just a certain amount of cost, so we have to hit a certain threshold. That's why it's slightly higher. We tried to keep it as low as possible, and that's why we included pre-K as a way for schools to have another option to reach those numbers. So in that same vein, assume, you know, making the huge assumption that Prosper Valley ever gets back online, they don't have a pre-K. Are you going to put a pre-K in Prosper Valley if it comes back online? If you're it's going to include pre-K as a criteria I think in that some of it's this? Not, it's where, not where a criteria it a because period? it's an or. It's separate numbers. It's or 40 students. Yeah. Are I mean, I would hope so. Well, I would, but board. I would also say if you've got, I don't know, how many on the waiting list do we have at Woodstock for pre-K? Um, we had about 20. Wow. wow. Yeah, 20 on the waiting list. So I, I, I believe that that was the number when we were. I mean, and, and we've talked, I've only putting this, these two things together because we said we wanted to find a way to, you know, accommodate these people. Um, and we're talking about a question I'm going to have later about reasonably close campus. Why wouldn't you have a pre kit? I'm, I'm just putting these things out there because it's going, to, uh, it's going to impact how some of these sentences play out. You know, if you, then you have to commit to putting a pre K at Prosper Valley um, to, you know, you can accommodate those kids and you can, and you can also make them eat, because then that's going to add 20 students, that could add 20 students to that school. Well, part of our thinking was to incentivize more pre-K, right? We're not trying to stop that, but it's not a policy conversation for this policy, right? Well, that is a separate conversation. I think Are the first sentence is really important in this policy. Um, there's an affirmed commitment to maintain investment in each of the campuses equally. Okay. I think that means something. I don't think that's just like boilerplate stuff, even though the first paragraph often seems like that. <laughs> so, um, if Prosper I mean, Valley. That's just me. I'm just one person. That's how I. If Prosper think Valley about is a K through six school and didn't have a preschool, mm -hmm. you need 56 students. That's eight students per. 56 divided by the seven, right? Okay. Yeah, I read that. Okay. So then if you do open up a preschool, you're going to need at least 10 or whatever we're saying in here to get the preschool open, okay? That would jump you up to the 66. 66 divided by the eight is 8.25 per class. I'm not, that's not even addressing any of my questions, Jim, so I'm not exactly sure how that's helpful. So I'll just move on. Yeah. To my, I'm just gonna move on to my next question. Okay. Um, could someone define reasonably close campus and could someone define geographically distant? Yes. Um, I think it's important to note that that's a the sort of final sentence that just is saying those are factors that we can converse about and that may impact the decisions. That we, didn't, um, we didn't set definite numbers uh, because we wanted there to be some flexibility. And I mean, it basically, um, we're, we're trying to like set a guide for the board to have a conversation without being so strict as to saying here's what you have to do, right? I mean, policy should not determine an outcome. So what we're trying to say to the board is these are other things you may have a conversation about, um, but we don't want to tell you that here's the number of miles because it may that may predetermine an outcome, and we don't want to do that. But we want to be sure that conversations will include, hey, you know, well this school is really far, so there's going to be a transportation cost and talk about all of that or hey you know there's not really very big cost savings maybe this isn't worth doing even though all the numbers are here and so and that sort of thing I wonder if the other kind of helpful piece here is that this is about this is what triggers a conversation not an action uh, but it just triggers a conversation for the board um, and then there's a, a another piece that, that comes along in terms of school closure uh, but this is, how, how do we have it feel like a, a town isn't being just targeted, right? You know, without, without why, you know, why are you bringing our numbers up versus another number? So it just gives you a, a list of things to consider about whether or not a conversation should be held. Um, and that, so that's, that's the only thing that happens with this particular Yeah, so, so now like kind of tricking in my mind back to the conversations that we've had in multiple multiple meetings we were all stuck on this part here and when we finally came around to say that this campus sustainability policy has nothing to do with closing a school it has nothing to do because there's a policy after this okay this is where the number one superintendent provides us a report we just approved that now 
if enrollment falls down and the financial and the student outcomes are all, these are the conversations that the board's <coughs> going to have. So to move over to the next closure one that we haven't done yet, okay? Yes, do we have it approved here? No, we have not talked about it yet. Right, right. Sorry. We don't have yeah. it on the first meeting, okay? So Mary Beth could come in to us and say to us, you know, Killington Elementary School, and I'll always use my school, okay, folks? So Killington Elementary School only has 50 students in it, and it's a pre-K through 6. Okay, the financials, they're still within 120% of the average of the district. And the student outcomes are great. So because they don't have 56 students in it and there's only six less, is it really a reason to move to the next step? We felt as a, as a subcommittee that it's not, okay? Um, and then when it came down in here, the capacity of regional closed camps if the schools are different and relative cost savings. The relative cost savings is, is that, so if you're gonna shut down Killington because there's only 50 kids on it from pre-K to six, or, or 60 kids pre-K to six, okay, because it's 66, and you're gonna move them all over to, maybe there's no room to move them into Woodstock. Maybe there's no room to move them into Pomfret. Maybe there's no room to, maybe the buses <coughs> are gonna be crazy. There's no savings at all. But we have to have the conversation, and this is what this does to say for sustainability of that school. We need to come back and say, what do we have to do to get that enrollment up there? Because that's what we heard from a lot of townspeople saying that now they believe that each individual town, that is the district's responsibility of trying to make, this is one of the reasons why we're looking at you know, new facilities or whatever, to drive more students or more families into all of our towns, not just one town. So we were stuck on this, I think, for like a good hour and a half of thinking it was closing a school, and we finally like, no, this is just sustainability. It has nothing to do with closing school. You know, I'll be honest that if it's 60 kids, if it's, if it's 56 kids for pre-K to sixth at Killington Elementary School, and the financials are over 130% of the average, and the student outcomes are really poor, I mean, we're gonna have to have a really serious conversation of finding out what it is. So I think we're all sitting here doing what we did for the first hour of thinking this as a closure. It's more of a wake-up call to get that report each year and then seeing. All right, Lou? Yeah, it's a way to look at the schools and to do it systemically, right? Rather than just saying, we're going to look at each one and say, oh, that's good, that's bad, that's good, that's bad. No, this is a way of saying to every school and every administration in their schools and, and all the residents of the towns, here's how we're going to look at your schools. It's also a conversation for the board to help improve those schools. I mean, we're not in the business of shutting down schools unless we absolutely have to. That's why it's a sustainability policy, right? So to look at it any other way would be, I think, Correct. I think Patty has more questions. Yeah. Um, knowing that, what what percentage of our um, cost at a school is is staffing? Is it seventy? Is somewhere 80? the eighty mm -hmm. seventy? I mean, is there? Um, would though would that be factored in in terms of relative cost? Look, say say you're you're a K through three, and three of your staff are people that have been in the district for twenty five years. You, your cost per student. Right. It's going to be significantly greater right. than a school that has a, a younger teacher population. Yeah. Um, I, I just want to know that you know, with these percentiles, we're going to think about. There's room to think about something like that. There's room to think about everything in this structure, right? This is not predetermining. I'm just, it's just a Lou, I'm just reading it, and schools, I'm just. Right? This is the, the well, numbers yeah, are Richard, here. And I'm just asking yeah, about it. It's a really good point, <laughs> right? And, and it's one that there is there is room to raise that consideration. These are more experienced teachers, you know, it's there just to try and ensure that we are rationalizing across. I, it, it's I a really good know, point. And that's why we include multiple points. There's no one single trigger, right? right. So, so it may cost more, but those teachers might be getting tremendous outcomes. And so that's why the board should look at all of these things. But this is a signal to the schools on here's how we're going to look at schools. Because we have to do something that's fair and understandable, right? We so the sustainability come part on that one, if you're just looking at the, um, the financial part, and it comes in and it says, you could have that argument. Killington could come in and say, well, wait a second, we have 
staff that's been here 20 years. That's why our cost is higher. But that gives each school in each town the conversation to say this is why. That's all this is. There, there, there's reasons, you know, why is your why is your financial up higher than the rest of them? Why are you at 125 percent? That could be one of the examples. I, I think that we don't want to incentivize um, getting rid of our seasoned teachers. So I wouldn't want to see that. And I think it's a really good point. And I think that we can talk about adding a piece of language like that. But another point that, that I think of is that the 120 percent of the average um, is actually a fairly big right. cushion. Okay. So it might accommodate that. And all the schools are going to have some more expensive teachers. So and but it's something for us to talk about. <coughs> and Carrie would do it also. She wasn't two days away from <laughs> um, is within the agreement you can't eliminate high cost teachers okay. you eliminate right. positions their seniority and this is so but we're not even that's right we're, not right. we're no, nowhere near that in with the way the policy is because yeah. 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 um, it does oh, I'm sorry Paige, just one other go ahead yep. that may help you feel that it does okay. suggest that with the annual report that the superintendent make a you know make a recommendation based on this and that would certainly be something so if you were looking at staffing and you said oh the reason the numbers are so high is related to the fact that we have people higher than salaries then it would be even a non-issue i would assume coming from so that good. report and are we c including the middle school high school numbers in this um for i mean we're not going to close the middle school high we school have, I mean, we have, um we have it there because as uh, Jim and Lou were saying, we, d we don't want this, to, this policy to solely be a closure, a well, precursor to closure. Inse instead, we're saying it's unacceptable for, you know, our policy is it's unacceptable for the middle school, high school to exceed 120% of the state average. So if that happens, then we're going to address it. That's why so that's it's there. sustainability <coughs> in terms of a budget. Exactly. Okay. Right. okay, thank you. Yep. Any other questions? Yeah. So just a uh, point of clarity and then maybe consistency in the student outcomes paragraph. Yeah. We use district a lot in there, but then when it says elementary school results of standardized testing should not be 20% below the elementary school averages, should district elementary school be in there too? Because we we're not. To say that. Yes, yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, Richard, in, in general, where are we? in relation to the school average on our At high school, school average is about 15.7, and we're over 18. So I'm not quite sure what that comes out to, but it's it's probably approaching the 1.15 range at high school. At the elementary schools, I can pull that up if you just give me a second. I just want to make sure see what we're doing for ourselves. like. Right that we are outside of policy right out of the chute. <laughs> yeah. well, we did talk about that. We, we did, and I thought we had the room on it, but let me just confirm. Now, the numbers that you're giving, Richard, are they the state numbers? Yeah, there's, this, it's the state number for last year. Yeah, well, yeah but that's why, that's why we put in here that it's a three, it's based on a two-year consecutive right. year average of, of the average of our district elementary schools, okay? So it's our district. So if the state's saying we're at 115, that has nothing. Uh, 115. It has nothing to do because let's say three schools in our in our elementary school are at fifteen thousand dollars per pupil. That's forty-five thousand. And if another school is at say eighteen thousand, I think we have one. I think we have three around fifteen, a little under fourteen, or whatever. Then one at eighteen. So then eighteen thousand. Plus the forty-five thousand is sixty-three thousand divided by the four elementary schools. It's fifteen thousand seven hundred and fifty dollars is the average. And then if you add one hundred and twenty percent to that, you're up to eighteen thousand nine hundred dollars. The sample is us. You know, it's not. The, it's not the. That's why it's worded in here of our district. But for the middle school, school, high school, high school is the state, state average. average. But we also because went through the whole thing that said we're not ever shutting down our high school. I don't believe. But we wanted to give. We wanted to give something that there should be a report out so that we can say, hey, wait a second, our high school is way more than most other high schools. 
we don't have another high school to average in. And all and all this is doing is is necessitating a conversation about Correct. that. Yes. yes. That's so all this is. And there's a requirement that the finance committee, if this if this were triggered, brings this to the full board's attention. Well, that would be a discussion for the finance committee to have, right? I, we're just creating a policy yeah. to say like this is a trigger a board conversation. No, I think it's really good right? to have the. I mean, I. And I we're, think this is almost like what Matt Stover. I mean, it's like the guy's been gone now for a while, but yeah. this is numbers Three that times. he was trying to say. <laughs> and but but what we tried doing is saying let's take our elementary schools and average them, not use the state. Yeah. Matt was always using the state. We were trying to use our own. We because didn't necessarily say who would bring it. We just. If the Congress, the, after the superintendent gives the report, then we have to schedule um, yeah. the conversation <laughs> if it's recommended. The cake. Any other questions? There's a cake. I'm sorry, I have one. I know that I'm not sure. sure. Go ahead. I have one quick question. Um, I'm just curious to know how these numbers were decided on in terms of number of students per grade. Is that like a teacher student ratio, or does that have something to do with the financial feasibility of each school? We looked, I, it, um, I believe that the way that we did that is we looked at the range of class sizes and if we said, okay, if you have so many grades in a school, this would be the num this would be the range that you would have that would fit into that class size. Okay, thank you. And, and no judgment on combined grades. No judgment. No. No. It's not the actual figure. Right. <laughs> All those in favor of the motion on the table, say aye. 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 All those opposed? Okay, Raina. We're going to second reading on that one. Next. I make a motion first to approve the first reading of the grading policy. We have a second. 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 No, we can work on that yet. You can only read four times. Does anybody have any <laughs> <laughs> That's all I can accommodate. Any questions? Have any questions on the grading policy that you pre read and that we had a presentation on last week? So we passed out the minutes from the last two meetings. Um, if you, if that gives even more detail of how we arrived at this, because it <coughs> details our conversation. Um, you know, uh, from the presentation that we saw last week, I think I recall mentioning that the um, the draft that was up there was brief, and we were going to add to it. So basically, what we wanted to do was make sure we really had to strike a balance between giving the administration flexibility, I mean, this is always the case, and having a level of detail where we felt there could be accountability, right? Some specificity. So I think that what we came up with wi was um, these sort of headings that say these are th all of the aspects of um, the grading policy that we think are important, but if you read most of them underneath say, the details of this are going to be in these procedures. So it just makes sure that none of this, um, that all of it is actually detailed in the procedures. So um, I think that's pretty much what I have to say about it. Can I, can I just add, are you going to? No, go ahead. <laughs> Well, um, and it's not not really re well. It is relevant, but it's um, relevant to the conversation, which is to say that Patty and I um, last week had a conversation with a parent who I suspect represents a number of other parents. And this is probably not new, but it certainly is um, acute in that we just had a conversation. <coughs> it was an impassioned conversation with us about communicating this policy, um, feeling that this is not translating uh, to the need to train teachers and it's not it's not translating to parents to, to fully un understand it. So I would just put out there that based on this conversation, Patty may have more to, uh, to add that we think very deliberately about getting this information out and understood. That's a really good point. But um, I think there was a, a sea change here in understanding and, and we need to push that out to the community. So uh, what, if I could res respond sure. to that, Bob, um, one of the ways that kind of we talked about doing that, so 
here are the categories where we're, we will give very de definitive procedure, and then this will go into the handbook. We are, and Gary, you may want to speak to that. Um, you're talking about delivering the handbook actually digitally this year, so we can email it out to all parents, so they'll have access to it right in their home. Um, so they should not only have the policy, but the procedure that will be underneath it. And I, and I think that works, but I think there's got to be some face-to-face -face interactive time, whether that's at the beginning of school, in the auditorium, however however you think best, to really give people a chance to um, to, to ask questions and understand the policy. Well, I would say the other thing is that given the changes that came from the administration and the committee, the the form of proficiency-based grading that we're moving forward with is far more understandable for those parents that won't necessarily show up and ask questions, right? Mm -hmm. People are going to get something that they've seen before and they understand. It's not going to be something brand new. So there's a middle ground that we've struck that I think is a win-win. So I just want to add that you know on the agenda item it's called proficiency grading and it's also called at the top of the page and and we very um, purposefully so, yeah. call it grading policy, not proficiency, because it is a hybrid policy. So I one other piece, Bob, just to speak to that is the first report card comes out in November. Uh, <coughs> October. October, there'll be a discussion here at the board again of the grading policy. You're looking at a survey going out at that time. So there's, we're looking to have a number of opportunities for people to be able to get feedback so we can see whether it is indeed being understood or not, mm -hmm. as opposed to waiting until the end of the year. Mm -hmm. We may want to think about we're, we're going to go out with a number of conversations in the community around Portrait of Graduate, right? Strategic plan. Yeah, so f for the strategic plan, we'll be working with the community, yes, around that once, we, like now that it's formally voted, we'll be, be talking with folks. Um, I, I would suspect that probably the, the best place to talk to families about it would be the kind of curriculum night at the middle school, high school, given that that's, that's the group of folks that would be most significantly impacted. Um, and also to just connect with Richard's point on October 14th, we will have another report back to the board. But um, we can think about that in terms of implementation and to be sure, you know, maybe even a one page, we'll have to think about what that might look like, but to be sure that everybody has the updated information. And so, Wait, uh, Patty. Yeah, go ahead, Patty. Um, in the extra credit retake assignment paragraph um, about retaking assignments under special conditions, um, I mean specific conditions, pardon me, I mean is that something that will be defined for people in the handbook? In the handbook? Yes. I mean and we've said, you have said in the handbook for so many other things it might be, uh, not to be redundant, but you might want to put that there too it because actually that's actually in the next paragraph. Okay. Yeah. We want, we want but that, the I mean, that's to make this work for teachers. Teachers have got to buy into it, so that's kind of where we're going. We didn't want to define. But those, I think, this is is summative in the second mm -hmm. paragraph, right? In the first, no, may not. In cases in which students wish to improve a summative assignment, program, summative assessment opportunities will be provided to give students an additional opportunity to show mastery of the standards. Procedures on relating, on on retaking assignments will be listed in the student handbook. Actually, the clear the. We should have the word summative in the first, in the second sentence, the one that begins with alternative. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and if I could ask one other question, um, and then I know Jim, you talked about this a lot at the last discussion on this, about the turnaround time for grade entry. Right. Um, will that also be something defined for people oh, in the handbook? I actually, a sentence got dropped yeah, off. It's not in there. Yeah, there's a sentence that should be there that's in the most recent draft that says that. Time, timeliness will be defined, the timeline okay. in the student handbook. Great, thanks. Yeah. But, but I think it's important as a board, and you know, as we go forward with this and you communicate this, that people understand the benefits of proficiency-based grading because it is different. Like, why does it make sense for our students? This is a conversation we should consistently have and we should communicate to people, not just the nuts and bolts of how it works, but why does it make sense for a learner? Like, why does a decaying average work for a learner, right? That's the conversation that I think this community deserves to have as we move forward. Um, uh, just another point of consistency, maybe, on formative and summative grading. Point two, summative assessments, as examples of summative assessments may include and list them down. And then, but point one, formative assessments, as formative assessments include. And just may include. Would it be great right. to? Yeah. Either Thank you. one. <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah. And then um, I had a question about um, grading 
policy. I didn't see anything on here, and it might be a completely different policy, so excuse me if it is for Karen, maybe. Question for students with IEPs, are they held to a different grading standard system? Is there a different policy? No, there's not a different policy. I mean, I guess there's, there's accommodations which help students' IEPs yeah. access the regular curriculum if there's a more intensive need, a modification is made by the IEP, so that's that. maybe that should be in here. Okay. And that would go back to the previous policy that that could be one of the examples of, you know, the cost per pupil is higher in that school because they may have more needs for IEP or whatever. And that's where the superintendent would come in that report and say, this school is at X percent, their grades are a little bit lower, but the reasoning being, and we didn't want to get into that, we want to leave that to the superintendent. No, that's fine. I just want to make that sure that if level, it wouldn't show up in individual buildings. Right. right. Okay. Regardless of, you know, per pupil cost, I just want to make sure that if there are accommodations and ways in which that happens, that that should be addressed if, if it's not and where it is. I just don't know. Well, we don't so. have the policy to preclude anything like that. Okay. Make that, it more that was a question. So, yeah. You know. so, thank you. So my only thing, like listening, Bob, what you had said in the beginning, and this is where um, towards the end of the meeting the other day I had like the first back the policy part before it gets into the aspects to me it's just flop I mean I thought you know like you, you go right down you start reading standard-based learning one to four proficiency <laughs> form. I know it's not but like we're being asked the question of is that how are we going to be communicating and the last sentence or whatever is saying the board will hold the administration responsible for successfully identifying implementing and communicating <laughs> the procedures in a clear and consistent manner and I think that was your question mm -hmm. okay but you went right to all this other stuff and not reading like what I say I don't read and and my biggest concern is is that I've been pushing for and I would like the rest of the board because you did it yourself say that that needs to be a bullet point just like one through four proficiency grading scale of formative and summative I would like that last sentence to come down. It's basically saying the board will hold the administration responsible for successfully identifying, implementing, and communicating the procedures in a clear and consistent manner as a bullet point like the rest. So it's clear, and we don't have these questions coming from the well, community. Let me, let me just clarify that I, I had read that, but I wanted to bring you a very recent interaction with a parent that was very meaningful to me that represents that that statement definitely needs to be there. I don't need it to pull down. It's in the policy. So it's an expectation the board holds the administration to. I was just giving you an example of the real need, passionate need, emotional need to communicate the policy out. And, and I'm giving you the need why I think <laughs> that it should be a bold print item. But you can, you can approve the first you. read and have further discussion as, as it relates to that. Yeah. So let's approve our first read. Where is the page? She's She's hiding. Hiding. page. 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 Are there any other questions on it? <laughs> Are there any other questions? <laughs> <laughs> it's like a magic show. <laughs> yeah. No more questions. I have All those in favor of the motion on the table? Say aye. Melina had a question. Melina had a question. I'm sorry. Melina. Am, Melina. I allowed, am I allowed to ask questions about yes. what's yes. on the minutes? Just yes. something I, I mean, that right. captured my attention. <laughs> Um, and I feel that maybe it may not be approved, Melissa. So that's can fine. It. I don't no, know. It was handed to <laughs> us, and I'm curious. It's like minutes from a two-hour meeting. Yeah. Just keep that in mind too. <laughs> and I just didn't know. Um, it just came. It must have come up in discussion, and it's about the honors courses. And I yeah. guess it was decided to drop the designation. And I was curious why, and, and if that's we're going to really be good question. talking yes. about is like minutes questions good? That's one of the better right. ones. Right. So I'm just so. curious about that. Good that you give her it's your approval of the question. <laughs> I wasn't giving her my, my opinion of the, by the question. All right, who wants to take that one? I believe what we had said there is when you're going on to a GPA later on in, in college, mm -hmm. okay, a four is a four. It doesn't okay. matter what it is, okay. Um, the the theory in this school at this time, where did Garen go? <laughs> <laughs> and Garen was not in this meeting while we were having this discussion, oh, whatever. Okay. But we felt that the honors class mm -hmm. it wasn't giving the half a point like it or, or whatever it was it used to get five five percent five points back onto your grade for taking honors mm -hmm. and what we've heard from a lot of students or whatever is that 
it really was the extra credit that would get them or doing a little extra in the class not necessarily what was being taught in the class the student would have to take it a little bit further and do more I just want to back up a little bit because I think a lot of people probably don't know that that the, the honors designation is there there haven't been a, an honors class for a, a little while um, so you you get honors not by being in an honors class you get an honors yeah. designation by yeah getting of it the highest grade in that class and so we had a discussion yes. about this credit issue and that it's kind of misleading for the transcript to have this designation when it's actually not and it does you know when you take an honors class it's harder so right. colleges know that mm -hmm. and if you get a lower grade in it they they might you know often we hear there they think a, a B plus in an honors class is is better than you know a, an A in a non honors class um, okay. So if they're seeing it, they're, they're thinking that it's something that it's not. And um, okay. yeah, so for all these reasons, we decided that uh, we, we did would rather see honors classes, mm -hmm. but right. we, we uh, didn't like these honors We did ask for the administration to come back with a plan for honors in the future. Like okay. I guess my concern was, okay, if we're talking about taking away the honors designation, because I know it can work differently. Some, some, yes, there's not an honors class anymore. You get a contract from a teacher, or you take, you do the extra work. But, you know, there's honors and then there's AP. So I just wanted to make sure, like, where, what track are we going to? And th that just concerned me. I just, I just wanted to hear the reasoning behind it. And because I know that, you know, it's still something that is looked at in transcripts. It's still things that parents look at when they look at course selections. And so it, it's important. And so, yeah. Uh, yeah. One other piece, Melinda, from that conversation was related to school. If honors aren't offered, mm -hmm. it is not hold against a student that oh you didn't take that piece of um, but if it's if it's offered and if they didn't get a four in the class it appears like there was a more challenging option that was available a more challenging class that was available to students mm -hmm. that actually wasn't so there was there was quite a debate um, amongst the, the the committee around that particular piece and I think it's certainly something that's going to require more work as we go forward in terms of looking at that particular option but there were uh, that was another lens that if you took a class but you didn't get all the way up to the four it could appear that there was an honors option available to you that you did not take okay. yeah, but you could get a four yeah. but you didn't have the four asterisk Right. right. There's I two think that's four. the answer to your question, right? So someone can yeah, have a 96. It's, it's complex, but it's also, you don't want to see those courses we disappearing do from, from a course catalog someone without can have an explanation. Okay. Yeah, I think that we should. The reality is there is no honors course. That was the thing we came to. Okay. So nothing's disappearing. Okay, in that's good to know. I, like so I, said, I don't yeah. have kids in the high school yet. So yeah. I, I think we should <laughs> talk about it further. It does deserve a further conversation. Yeah, absolutely. All those in favor of the original motion on the table say aye. 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 All those opposed? I have a motion to adjourn the meeting, please. Please um, say so thanks to the policy committee. Round yeah. of applause. Yeah. 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 Yeah.